in uh, giving back to the community around him, but the whole entire country, actually the world in Facebook and the different YouTube channels and things like that. Um, Brian is just an influencer. Honored to have him here on Callahan's Corner today. If you're joining us live or on the recorded version, uh, myself and Brian are happy to answer any questions live. But uh, a couple of things that we're going to dive into. I got Brian here uh, via phone, wasn't able to get a Wi-Fi connection in his area. Uh, but we're going to be talking around two or three main topics today. And we're going to be talking about automating your lawn care snow removal business, essential business, and giving back and interacting with other like-minded individuals in the lawn care and snow removal industry. And um, one of the first times that Brian and I met was at SA5, I believe, is Service Autopilots Conference in person. Uh, known him a while online, um, but a lot of people know Brian, either met him at Service Autopilots Convention, GIE, or any of the other local events that he hangs out with folks. So, uh, Brian, really appreciate you joining me here. If people have never heard of you or don't know who you are, if you want to give a little background, uh, how you cut your teeth in the lawn care and snow removal um, industry and whereabouts in the country you're located. Oh, thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate it. It's kind of an honor. Um, we're located in Stillwater, Minnesota. We own a lawn and snow company. Um, been in business since 2002. I uh, got my start in 1993, I believe, if I remember, 94. Uh, been running hard ever since. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was like the first time I ever put a backpack blower on my back. Uh, this particular type of work just got into my blood and I haven't looked back ever since. Um, Anyway, yeah, I know we uh, are in Stillwater. Um, we've grown pretty decently the way I'd like to, which is just, you know, having a dense route, uh, not have to travel too far to, you know, chase down work, basically. Yeah, awesome. I really appreciate breaking that down. Very similar story as myself. Um, fell in love with it for the first day, literally pushing a lawnmower around my parents' neighborhood uh, to, to get some money to actually get car insurance to pay for the car. My folks were like... Uh, We'll help you out with a first vehicle, which ended up being a Nissan pickup with a lot of rust on it. But that was the uh, humble beginnings of Callahan's lawn care. But uh, yeah, the first time I, I popped out behind that lawnmower and the smell of that exhaust and the fresh cut grass, it was addictive. So it was something I really wanted to get into. Um, Brian, I know one of the big things that uh, you've been talking about a lot about lately is um, automations and uh, particularly uh, automating your sales process. So. Um, and we've seen a few of the comments on the Service Autopilot Facebook group as well as some of the other industry groups. Um, but basically, I kind of want to get your opinion on um, automation. A lot of people have a question like, if I have a small business, I have a big business, I have a business somewhere in between, is that something just for a massive corporation or is it worth looking at automations um, in a smaller business as we go to scale? So kind of curious your take on that. And if, if you're willing, I'd love to hop into your journey of automations and get your feedback on a couple of these questions that have been pre-submitted. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, last year I took on automations with service autopilot itself. Um, I really didn't get into any like sales or marketing type automations. Um, it was more about getting paid because I've been stiff so much. Um, but yeah, I mean, the automations there worked unbelievably just in regards to getting paid. Um, I mean, my AR, my AR report was at like an all-time low. Um, and then, of course, yeah, and I got to correct you. Yeah, it was SA4 was when we actually met. It, <laughs> and I think that was in Dallas, Texas. Um but anyway, um, your automations uh, with Simple Growth, I took those on last month. Um, I guess I could just break it down. I had my first automation trigger March 10th, and I had two of them kind of going at the same time, a spring cleanup and a fertilizer automation. Um, to my surprise, as of April 1st, new sales like within my client database is forty thousand dollars wow so that was if i'm my mass a little rusty here uh, being locked in the basement with this covid uh, lockdown my wife's practicing a little social distancing and uh is, is relocating me in the basement office but uh, that's about what two weeks brian you said that you've cleared about forty thousand dollars in upsells from your existing client 40, base. wow yeah. um to be upfront with you, I mean, I didn't know what to expect. 
Um, I kind of put like an ROI type budget on it. Like I figured by the end of the year, I will have spent $3,400 on your automations for five automations, um, which of course we're not even to December 31st yet. Um, I predicted if I could at least get 20,000 in new sales, I figured that'd be a good ROI. Well, we're already double that. <laughs> and I mean, we still have what? Well, I did do technically a mowing automation. We did get some work from that, not as much as I wanted. Um, but my database was already kind of tapped out for mowing. Um, but the fertilizer and sprinklers and the iterations and the seeding and the grub control was unbelievable. I mean, I don't even know how to explain that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we still have two more automations to go at the end of the year. So who knows what that's going to bring. Cool. No, I'm glad. Am I happy? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and uh, definitely not trying to pitch simple growth by any means, but I, you're talking about our upsell automations among some other things with 20 days to close that we do. But um, the idea, Brian, is is originally uh, when I built automations for my uh, my business, I don't know if you're really aware of the, 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 basically what happened is I had started this business kind of, we alluded to in the beginning of this talk here, um, to make some money in high school, I went through five years of college and we ended up having three, almost four crews full time while I was in college full time. And uh, basically ended up marrying the girl I was with in high school. And that business working literally a hundred hours a week ended up causing a divorce. So uh, my, tech, yeah. my my background really isn't in technology, but out of necessity, I, I went out and found a platform and automated my business. So um, I can, completely, can peak, I guess speak pretty candidly about the fact that um, kind of the journey that you're having right now um, kind of getting your toes wet and starting to dive into this is the same kind of journey I had as we were building all of this without any intentions of reselling it to individuals like yourself and helping folks out is um, I was a little nervous. I didn't know I had invested almost $150,000 in building these things out in my business over a four or five year span. Um, and just yeah. like you said, it was like when it hit, holy crap, what are we going to do? Now we've got all this work. Um, so we ended up having to actually create a process to recruit, train employees and then the manage the repetitive tasks down the line as they hit sequentially. So um, right. I, you kind of touched on it, but I would say if anybody's going out to, you don't worry about simple growth, but if you're going out to even build your own automations, I don't think you can start too early and they're not really there to replace people in your business. They're allowing your people to do more, um, I guess more activities that are, have a higher return on investment. So they avoid the tedious, in mundane things that we don't like doing. And I'm curious your take on it, Brian, or things you've seen just kind of get your, your toes wet in the automations that you built with Simple Growth is, um, are you finding that a lot of the things that you potentially would do in the spring uh, or have to do are just kind of now on autopilot? The fact that if you're busy or you know something's happening, you don't have to remember to do it, they just go out and it just happens with consistency. Are you seeing that kind of consistency that I saw in my business or is there different results or things you're seeing? Well, right now, I think with all the estimates that have been requested, um, I am finding that a lot of time is being spent doing estimates, but a lot of it, you know, you can kind of do from a sit down aspect of doing it all online. Um, and we already know what the uh, estimating is like with Service Autopilot, how fast that is. So, I mean, there's been so many that it's kind of making my head spin, especially the baffling part, to be honest with you, is just considering the state of the world right now um, and just everybody losing their jobs. I was absolutely shocked of all the people that actually wanted an estimate. <clears throat> so, I mean, when you implemented that 20 days to close, I mean, let's be real here. I mean, I went from March 10th to April 1st. I mean, that's 20 something days right there. <clears throat> You know, I mean, that's amazing. And then your technician told me to implement text messaging, which I was kind of skeptical about, but I went ahead and did it anyway. And I'm glad I did that because the communication just completely opened up, you know, on top of emailing and phone calls and just getting the estimates done. So, I mean, as far as like, is it on autopilot? No, I mean, somebody actually has to make the estimates, but as far as getting the sales, uh, to get out and get in, it's just phenomenal. I don't even know how to explain that. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate your, your feedback. I want to say what's up to uh, Big John. 
Payjack as well, uh, watching live. Um, Tony, we'll get, get to your question in a second here, but um, one thing I want to hit on, Brian, that you mentioned is a, a big thing when people are building these by themselves or they're working with Simple Growth as a certified advisor is the fact that um, they're concerned that they're going to over communicate or bother people and text messaging is a very big part of that. And uh, the, the key to success, if you're going out to build these automations in your lawn care home cleaning business, from what I've seen in my experience and what Brian kind of is resonating and confirming is the ability to communicate in multiple communication channels. So not only email, but text message and yes, phone calls or an automated ringless voicemail bomb. But those, the combination of the three spread out in a systematic way drives consistent sales results is Brian C. I mean, unbelievable, $40,000 of upsells from his existing client base in a little over, a little under two weeks. Um, and I don't know if you're willing to uh, share this, Brian, or even if you know the stat, but one of the questions by uh, uh, Tori was, uh, how many clients did did you market to? Do you have an idea ballpark what your client database yep. looked like? Yep, um, 744 legitimate clients. <clears throat> wow, so you were able to generate and basically raise that client lifetime value, that reoccurring, and not even, not only just one time, but it's reoccurring for the most part um, of $40,000 off a 700 person or ballpark 700 um, person database. That's huge. Yep. And I mean, the biggest thing, you know, some of these particular clients already had services, like some will have like lawn mowing already that they're going to be on board for already this year. But the automations were able to upsell like other services that, you know, I've kept track of on an Excel spreadsheet, you know. Like, okay, Mrs. Jones has mowing for the year, but now she wants fertilizer too. So I added up what fertilizer would be for the total year, and I put that into my Excel spreadsheet. So that's how I came up with this total. And then, you know, you had former clients. Um, you know, I've been getting them sold. Um, I've had lead clients where maybe they didn't want my estimate from last year or something. So now this year they actually want it. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, like you were saying earlier, how you spread out the text messaging, you know, with the email automation. Um, it's brilliant. I mean, I'm not, I know this is your business and it sounds like I'm promoting you. Maybe I am and I am. I mean, I don't want somebody to sit here and think that I'm getting paid for this or anything, but the sales, I can't even hardly believe it. I really can't. No, I appreciate it, brother. And, and neither one of us are really honest. We're talking about the success, but uh, let's be honest. This is this is some things that some people may want to try on their own. We're giving the best practice and in, in the mindset of abundance. And um, I want to, you know, I want to share this success story. Um, so we'll talk about automations a little bit for another minute or two. But then I want to really get into um, some really impressive things that you're doing locally in Minnesota, uh, because as of lately, Minnesota lawn care. Um, has been deemed non-essential in the COVID-19. So you've got a really cool story that needs to be shared, I, I feel, at least with the, uh, the lawn care community as a national leader. I uh, want to say what's up to Caleb as well. Um, a lot, lot, of, lot of the industry leaders, YouTube followers are, are joining us here live um, on this. So I want to give a shout out to everybody watching. And if you have any comments or questions for myself or Brian, we're ha happy to answer them. And I'll keep an eye on this post here for um, you know the next day or two. Uh, Jim says, hey, guys, going to pull the trigger on automation soon. So Jim, appreciate it, brother. Um, so just kind of wrapping that up, Ryan, um, the last thing I kind of wanted to hit that was interesting. It, it's something that we didn't really help you with. Um, but the interesting thing is, I think at least, you looked at what was one of the biggest, easiest pain points to tackle that had the biggest return on investment. Now, obviously, the sales and creating that higher return on investment is a huge, huge play. But you mentioned accounts receivable, and that was something, at least in my business in the early days, before we automated a system for collections and get a credit card on file that, you know, we would, I mean, it's embarrassing the amount of money people owed us at certain times. Um, but that seemed to be the biggest pain point that I could automate literally in like three to five minutes, maybe, I don't know, maybe a half hour I'm exaggerating, but within a half hour, um, I created a process of system to go out and systematically collect invoices and potentially pause services or alert me to pause services if people haven't paid. So, um, would you mind just kind of talking about that experience just a little more in depth? Because I thought um, that was interesting because that's very similar to my journey with automations. That was one of the first things I automated in my business. Uh, yeah, no, Service Autopilot's been great for that. I mean, obviously, there's the scheduling, uh, the emailing effect, invoicing, uh, you know, and then, you know, you get down to the 
accounts receivable. For me personally, up until I, you know, basically got on board with Service Autopilot Automations itself, like uh, I can't remember the name of the actual automation, but it's the one that will send out, you know, emails to clients saying, hey, you didn't pay your bill, you want to pay your bill, that type of thing. That automation alone put my AR down to the lowest I've ever seen it. And I believe I put a post out there maybe a year and a half ago on the Service Autopilot Facebook group where I think I collected like $8,000 or something in one day <laughs> uh, where, I mean, it was just unbelievable. I mean, the one story I do have is that I think people, clients, up until that point owed me so much money, you know, from the years I've been in business, I could put a kid through college on campus, pay for his tuition and books for four years. That's how much money I lost, I think, before getting the automation that helped me, you know, collect money. So, I mean, to go from that to an all-time low on my accounts receivable, I mean, it's just mind-blowing, you know? And that's a credit to Service Autopilot itself. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Service Autopilot has been a game changer in my life as far as my business and everything I've been doing. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough before they got uh, to the size they're at now, I ended up uh, hanging out with uh, Jonathan Potoshnik, the co-founder of Service Autopilot. And uh, a lot of people know Jonathan as the uh, lawn care millionaire on the YouTube series. Um, but I had the ability to spend two full days with him. I met a couple of lifetime long friends there. But um, it was interesting what I was able to take away in two days from his experience of growing a, a fully uh, residential business in Plano, Frisco, Texas, that was ten, basically annually around $10 million or above a year in residential only lawn care. Um, and those are a lot of the nuggets that I've been uh, fortunate enough to learn from Jonathan and then the other people I, I basically got a hold of and got into my inner circle, my round table. So um, I really appreciate you coming on here, Brian. But one thing before I let you go, and I know you've got a, a very compressed schedule, so I, I appreciate you breaking the time off, but is the essential business listing in Minnesota, uh, right up to before this, correct me if I'm wrong, lawn care was deemed non-essential. So if, if you aren't aware of what was going on, basically the government um, and locally there basically said lawn care providers could not go out and actually do their job. And in turn, their employees obviously didn't have a job to come to on a regular basis. So Brian, I'll let you do some justice to this, kind of give some background of the non-essential listing and how you went out through different letters and Facebooks and going out to uh, basically county commissioners and different people in local government around you and even outside of your area with other local government people uh, to basically create a national surge um, to basically help educate the the state in the areas in there to to basically um, lift the non-essential and basically I think believe today it was just announced that uh, you guys can actually start going out legally and working so um, if you want to give some background on that but I, I just really impressive obviously you're an industry and the leader or leader in the industry nationally but locally some of the stuff you've been doing helping other industry folks that uh, are less fortunate out with like trucks and trailers and mowers and things you've been doing I've been watching um, just another huge huge shout out to what you're doing locally right now so uh, Brian, if you wouldn't mind just kind of sharing that um, story and that journey to helping lawn care companies be essential in that Minnesota area. Well, I didn't even know what it was uh, when it first came out in, what was it, March 25th. Um, you know, that's where I started learning, you know, what essential versus non-essential is. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> uh, but... At that point, lawn care and landscaping workers were essential. Um, but less than 48 hours after March 25th, uh, we became non-essential. So we weren't a critical business. We were no exempt. Um, so we could not work. Well, I ended up writing a post at one point, I think it was April 3rd, on my own Facebook profile page. And that got noticed by a county commissioner here in Minnesota. I won't name the county. He wanted to be anonymous. But he ended up calling me because I had my phone number on this post. Um, and I'll make it short. In the, in the conversation, he basically said, they hear you. And I asked him, I go, who hears me? He says, 
the top legislators in Minnesota. And I, I didn't even know how to respond to that. Um, but in the, in the conversation, he also added, he says, keep the pressure on. And I don't know how to explain how it's still ringing in my head right now, but I sought out like people, you know, in my industry, um, you know, one guy, his name is Chris Baker. I think he's in service autopilot, Cassie Libby, us three, um, and another person, um, we kind of collaborated in a little, uh, Facebook message group, uh, you know, kind of a plan of attack. Cassie Libby went ahead and made a petition, um, which, you know, wants to, uh, help us become essential, like get signatures from people. And that right now I think is almost 35,000 signatures. Um, so that was amazing. And from that point on, I started like hitting up every senator, every representative I could get my hands on. Um, I kept sharing stuff on their Facebook pages, emailing them, uh, and so did they. And we got like a bunch of Minnesota owners involved and we told them, hey, we all gotta do this together. Um, we all gotta get to work. You know, I mean, crabgrass free emergent needs to get down. We're gonna miss that window. You know, I mean, we're gonna end up using double chemical. So it's a big shout out to Minnesota landscape and lawn care business owners for like seriously coming together to be heard by the governor of Minnesota. Um, it, it seriously makes me proud. You know, I mean, there's just, there's so many other people out there besides us that really went to town. I mean, there's Emery Scoop. He had a little spot on Fox 9 TV show, or I'm um, sorry, TV news uh, the night before the governor spoke. I mean, it, it was just all, it all came together and it was all like kind of instrumental in us all being heard as a whole entire industry in Minnesota. Um, and I did put out, you know, everything that I did on a Facebook group called Lawn Life because I know there's a bunch of Michigan people there that are trying to, you know, become essential also, but their governors, you know, kind of being, uh, I don't know how you say, not trying to have them become essential, uh, but I laid out the blueprint of what I did in hopes of helping them. Um, so whether it works or not, I don't know for them, but I figured, geez, it worked for me and it worked for our industry, why not pass it along? So, and I did get a bunch of uh, other representatives uh, that, you know, called me and let me know, hey, you're doing great, keep up the pressure. So, I mean, it was just reassuring that our legislators were actually working for us. Uh, so I just, I don't know, it just makes you proud that it all worked out. Yeah, I, I couldn't be happier for you guys and girls out, out there and getting that essential, um status it's just absolutely huge i mean you feel bad for a lot of these businesses that are deemed non-essential and haven't been able to have the tenacity that you guys have had to come together and i, I think that that in itself um the perspective of lawn care industry and the chuck in the truck um perception i guess in, in my opinion is the black eye of our industry but there is a lot of professionals just like yourself brian a lot of people watching here um that the lawn care industry is a professional business we mean business. We run uh, businesses on the up and up. They're on the books with insurance. They're employing a lot of people, helping put food on the table. And it's guys like you and John and Chris and Caleb and Jim, a bunch of the other people here watching that uh, are making this happen. So I couldn't be more happier for you. Um, so congratulations on that. One thing I will um, stress as a side note. So up in New York State, uh, upstate where I'm at, uh, off to our west is Erie County. Now, Erie County and Monroe County, both lawn care maintenance has been deemed essential. So hardscape and construction has not been deemed essential. So one of the gray areas that Erie County had and the way they posted essential was uh, landscape maintenance, but mulching was considered beautification. It wasn't considered maintenance as suppressing weeds and, and basically uh, holding in the moisture for the plant. So it could be argued either way, depending on your stance on that. But what I will say, Brian, and, and maybe some other folks in Minnesota watching, depending on the essential classification, is uh, their lawn care folks in Erie County were basically threatened by their governor to get um, directly on a news conference. And he pointed out landscapers that are not paying attention to the rules of essential will be shut down just like the bars and restaurants that have already been shut down in new york state because they had originally been given um 
some leeway and they didn't play by the rules and they continue to keep their bars open and, and, and not just um, the essential part of their business so they can actually still bring some revenue. So that's one of the scary things that we're seeing because I, I think the industry as a whole nationally and especially in Minnesota, uh, everybody's coming together and, and, and proving why we're essential. But I think the, um, the word to the wise there is be careful. If certain parts are deemed essential, don't go out and break the rules for health reasons as well as uh, gentlemen like Brian and everybody else in Minnesota that's fought so hard to have this happen. Don't let a few bad apples trying to go outside of what's essential ruin it for everybody. So that's uh, that's something right. we're seeing near my local area. So I thought I'd bring it up. Obviously, guys like yourself, Brian, and the other folks who are fighting that are not going to go outside of the, the constraints of that because you know how important it was and how hard it was to get it. But it's, um, it's a scary time. Uh, to think that a few people could ruin it for everybody now that we've fought for this. So I think we need to come together as a community more than ever, just like Brian yeah. has in his local community to make sure that everybody's playing by the rules. Uh, so Brian, obviously I know you've got a, a, a compressed schedule here, but any closing thoughts, any words of encouragement? I know um, right now we're seeing all time lows of costs on Facebook and Google for advertisements. Most businesses are contracting. They're not putting money into their marketing spend. Um, so I think if anything else, Brian, I think some words of encouragement from your scenario is in two weeks when everybody uh, thinks people aren't buying services, you were at, able to add an extra $40,000 of work right off your existing client base, which through an automated process, which is huge. But uh, as we wrap this up, um, any any closing thoughts or words of encouragement for anybody locally or, or even nationally or internationally? We've got... Uh, John Roberts and a bunch of the folks over there um, in Johnny Boy over over across the pond in England that I've been talking to. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to try to get Johnny Boy on a Facebook Live here uh, sooner than later to actually get uh, some international support for our industry and, and, and how they're affected by what's going on in, in the lo uh, local scene there and internationally as well. So, uh, Brian, I'll give you the floor right now to kind of close it up um, and uh, any closing thoughts. Uh, well, for sure. I mean, the database, obviously, I've always used my own database. I've never used it in an automation uh, fashion. Um, I highly recommend that. If you have a database with at least 100 clients or more, um, you know, you can whatever you got, really, I guess, will work out. Just try to sell current customers, former customers, and maybe lead clients that you weren't able to close the sale with before go ahead and try to upsell them again. Um, also, play by the rules. I mean, like Mike was saying, there are you know rules to this essential and non-essential thing. Uh, Chris Baker actually educated me today uh, because ours actually got updated and it became more strict. Um, and yeah, I mean, it could be $1,000 per employee apparently if you get caught as being non-essential out on the job or, you know, I don't even know if like bars are even allowed to open up and, you know, even, you know, hang out there and lock the doors or something. I don't know, <laughs> but just play by the rules. I mean, it's super hard for us here because the weather was nice. We wanted to work, but we understood if we got caught, that would be no good. That'd be like a black mark on your company. Um, the one thing I'll say is that everybody who knows Gary B, what does he always say? Play the long game. And, you know, for us to sit here for like a week and a half and wait for our own governor to just say you're essential now, you, you don't know the weight off of our shoulders that he just lifted. Um, and then you're grateful that you waited because there was that potential of getting that black mark on your company. Um, and you definitely don't want that. So just play by the rules and, you know, if you're going to invest in your company, I mean, like if you invest into your database, like I did, um, and test the waters, especially during these time, kind of times, which I'll be up front with you, I'm pretty shocked. Um, the amount of phone calls I've been getting, the website hits I've been getting, and then the actual response from my own database about people who actually want service considering there's so many people out of work. So if you, if you think you know, you probably don't know. <laughs> so test the waters and just find out for yourself. I realize every market is different. Um, I got a good market, I realize that, but I know there's other people out there that are hurting. Uh, just keep up the good fight. 
Yeah, thanks, Brian. I, I want to answer one question real quick here before we wrap this up. Um, and just to add on real quickly about playing by the rules and things you just talked about. Couldn't agree any more than the way you put it was perfect. Uh, most states, and I'm not sure about Minnesota, but just to throw it out there with th things changing over there, most states now are actually requiring a, um, a piece of paper certificate that actually proves that you have been set up as essential. Uh, so New York State not only um, was lawn care and landscaping was deemed essential or maintenance, uh, but you actually needed to have a physical print out of it. Um, and it's being enforced by the sheriff. I know a couple of companies we work with out in Arizona, there's actually roadblocks. Um, and the first time you go through, they've been kind of giving you a pass if you don't have the essential paperwork. Second time, just like Brian said, there's some hefty fines. I've seen some, depending on the part of the country, up to $10,000. So they're not joking around. Um, this is a pandemic, so it needs to be uh, treated as such. And uh, last, thing I wanted, last thing I wanted to address, Brian, and, and you may have um, – a quick, quick answer that Scott says, it's weird when uh, lots are not working. So I think what he's referring to is it's weird that in your market or some of the other markets, we've been pushing these automations in um, that it's weird that it's working to such an effect. But uh, I can tell you that Brian's story is not unusual. We've had several clients getting 70 or 80 estimate requests literally in two to three hours right now with this upsell process. Um, so I'm just going to resonate on the key to success. If you're going out and doing this in your business, I'm in the mindset of abundance. I'm going to tell you how we do it um, in my business and as well at Simple Growth when we help folks out like Brian. Um, but Brian, acts, you know, he, he, I think he followed the best practice and he put his own local spin on it from what I can under, understand and remember. But the idea is you want to talk to the person where they're in the customer life cycle. So part of the reason why I've been so successful, Brian was so successful and other people are successful is you want to talk to where they're at in the customer life cycle. So I'm in several email lists for different franchises and things like that. When you send out a bulk email blast to your clients and leads, and it's something generic, and I'll kind of uh, give you a basic example. Right before lawn mowing season was starting to ramp up, uh, I got an email from a franchise and it said, uh, it's time to re-sign up for your lawn mowing. If you've already signed up, please disregard this, or if you've canceled the service, we're sorry to see you go. Now, what does that say to your potential client or new client? You don't care about them. You're not talking about them specifically, where they're at in the customer life cycle. So whether they're a lead, a client, a canceled client, or a lost estimate, the ability to have marketing work through email, text messaging, and phone calls is having a personal but automated conversation. Let me say that again, personal but automated conversation. So most of the emails that we're using with this process, if we're using an email, look personal. They're not branded, they're plain text, and one of them actually looks like it's sent out of your iPhone. Yeah. People think you've actually sent it. So we're creating an automated but personal conversation that looks personal. It doesn't look over slimy because people recognize a sales pitch when they see a sales pitch. And it's based on the timing and where they're at in that customer life cycle. And that, Scott, is the secret sauce. So if you see a lot of people going out and doing generic email blast or on Facebook. Maybe they're doing a Facebook Messenger ad to Messenger. Uh, if you're running into a bot and you can talk to them with some AI, artificial intelligence, and then alert a live person to come in and talk to them, that's personal. But if you're driving a Facebook Messenger ad to a thing that pops up and it says, tell me about your service, what services you offer, what are your hours, and another generic question you could stick in there. That is not what we want to do. We have an automated but personal interaction. That's the key to success when automating your business, especially in times like this. Um, and Brian did a hell of a job with his marketing documents and customizing them and making them personal to his business. Um, but from what I remember, Brian, you stuck to the best practice that we kind of provided um, and trusted it. And obviously that trust uh, has netted you some pretty substantial gains. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate what you're doing for the industry, brother. Congratulations to you and everybody else in Minnesota putting up the good fight. Um, play by the rules, folks. And uh, if you are watching tomorrow, uh, SA Weekly Talk Show, uh, Cody Owen and I are going to be interviewing Michelle from Pink Collars. We're going to be talking about how to set up a remote office and all the tips and tricks that you need right now. Even if your business is deemed essential, you shouldn't necessarily have an office staff together in the same office with social distancing. So we're going to break down how to run a lawn care, snow removal, or even home cleaning business in this new remote time 
to play by the rules and keep your team safe, but still provide excellent customer service. So we'll check you out. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, 12 Central, right on the Service Autopilot Facebook page. If any other questions, drop them here. Brian and I will keep a look at this. Brian, thanks again. And uh, you can't see it. We've got John, Caleb, Chris Baker, Jim Morrison, um, and the whole crew uh, that we know in the Facebook and YouTube scenarios. So I appreciate all you guys and girls joining us on this. And Brent, ring it in. Uh, one of these times we got to get you back on here where that camera works. But man, uh, looking good and just making it look easy, brother. So I appreciate everything you do for our industry. Thank you, sir. Appreciate right. it. Very honored. All right, brother. Have a good one. I appreciate it. You too. Thank you. Yep. See ya.